Brian did. Well, I was just like everybody else. I needed work. So I took off looking for work. I headed west. So I didn't get too far west before I stopped in my first town, a place called Springfield, Missouri. We're from there. Oh, we're from Springfield. Oh, Springfield. Well, you know the story then. Yeah, you do? All right, good. <laughs> now, Springfield, more of just a stopping point for me, but I did find a card game right away, and if you don't know anything else about me, surely you know that I ain't passing me up a good game of poker. Now, in this game, I played with a fella by the name of Davis Tut. And Davis, he was a southern boy, and of course, I fought for the North during the war, so... How we got long and well enough to sit across the table from each other? I have no idea. <laughs> Man, that guy really did not like me at all. You know, come to think of it, it might have had something to do with me seeing his girlfriend. <laughs> Well, that's a story for a different time. Now, we did play some cards. We played for a couple days, and unfortunately, I ended up owing him about $35. Now, $35 being quite a sum of money that I didn't have, and Davis really wanted some collateral, well, I didn't know what I was going to do. All I had was an old pocket watch and my daddy would give me and I wasn't about to give that up. But Davis, he was relentless. He wanted something to ensure him that he was going to get his money back. So, reluctantly, I did end up giving him that pocket watch, but I told him, I said, now Davis, don't be going around telling everybody how you took that from me in a card game, because that ain't how it happened. That watch means a whole lot more to me than $35, and I'm getting it back. Well, the very next day, the very next day, here's Davis Tut on the streets of Springfield swinging that watch around, taunting me with it. Oh, I yelled at him across the town square, told him to knock it off, but he didn't want to listen. He yells back at me, I yell back at him. Then what's he do? He pulls out a gun and he takes a shot at me. Landed right at my feet. Well, if you know anything about the West, you don't take a shot at somebody unless you expect one coming right back at you. And I don't miss. I lined up at David 75 yards across that town square with my 36 caliber black powder pistol. Bang, one shot right to the heart. Well, the authorities there in Springfield were none too happy with me shooting a fella down in their streets. And they arrested me. They told me that I was liable for the death of Davis Tut. Well, I said, what about self-defense? He shot first. Yeah, all the witnesses on his side said he was just funning around. He wasn't really shooting at me. You know, I'm quite sure he doesn't think it's too fun anymore. <laughs> well, the judge saw it my way. Self-defense. I was acquitted there in Springfield. But I did figure it's about high time I got out of town. Now, as I'm leaving town, I run into another fellow who just happened to be at that gunfight. He saw the whole thing. He was a writer by the name of Henry Nickel. Now, Mr. Nickel, he wrote for Harper's Month. He wrote a lot of them dime novels out on the East Coast. Said he wanted to do an interview with me. Said the people out there, they needed a, a hero of the new frontier. And, well, I guess he's going to make me it. Now, in this interview, I did tell him some stories about myself. And, yeah, maybe I exaggerated just a tad but not nearly as much as he did. By the time he told that story, he had me killing over 200 people. <laughs> Can you believe that? It was more like less than a half a dozen at this point. <laughs> but it did make me famous. I went from being James Butler Hickok to being Wild Bill Hickok, the Prince of the Pistoliers. 
the greatest gunfighter the West had ever seen. And while the pain was nice, Nick kind of put a target on my back. Now every guy that had a gun wanted to be the guy that shot down the greatest gunfighter. Well, I had to be extra cautious from then on. Now, I still need to get out of Springfield. Though acquitted, they were not happy about it. Well, I still needed work, so I took off and I headed west again. Oh, I traveled across Kansas doing odd jobs just to survive. I drove a little freight for a while, scouted all over that place. And as I'm out there scouting, I noticed a lot of small towns were sprouting up out there. Yeah, it seemed like everybody just kind of headed west on this big land grab, you know? Well, it also seemed to me not a lot of them towns had any law in them to speak of. Kind of gave me an idea, maybe I should be a lawman. So that's what I did. Now I cleaned up a lot of towns across Kansas, places like Fort Riley, Wichita, Hayes City, now a couple more, till I ended up in Abilene, Kansas. Now see Abilene, it was a rough cattle town. One of the roughest there was. Them cattle drives, they'd come through there, bring all sorts of outlaws and ruffians with them. They'd shoot up the town, scare the daylights out of the good folks there just trying to make a life for themselves. The people of Abilene, well, they were more than happy when they heard the great Wild Bill Hickok had taken the job as their marshal and was going to clean that place up. I got there, I laid down some new ground rules. Do not bring your guns to town. Certainly don't be shooting them off in city limits. There was this guy. There's always this guy, right? Yeah. Fellow by the name of Phil Coe. Phil, he was a Texas cattleman. He bought a bar there in Abilene and I guess he had a little problem with my authority. See, I was a marshal. I laid down the rules and I enforced them. And Phil, he didn't want to follow the rules. He just wanted to argue with me about them all the time. Every day it seemed there was something new with that guy. Well, till early one evening, I'm sitting in a saloon minding my own business winding down from a long day's work and I hear this ruckus in the street. People are screaming and hollering. Guns are going off everywhere. I'm right outside to investigate. And who is it? It's Phil Coe and all his friends shooting up the town, scaring everybody. Well, much like Davis, I yelled at him to knock it off too, but he didn't want to listen either. Pretty soon we got this big shouting match going on and well Phil reaches for his pistol. Big mistake. I'm quicker. I saw him reach for his reach for my drew first bam. Shot him dead right there. But like I said, he had all those friends with him. And they all had guns too. I'm by myself. I'm on the defensive. I looked up at them all and I yelled. Who wants the rest of these? Nobody said a word. Till I heard somebody yell my name from back in the alley, I turned quick shot again. Oh, I shot my deputy, Mike Williams. <laughs> Some of you guys are laughing about that. Come on now, I, let me try it again. I shot my friend, my deputy. Oh, yeah. Oh, Maybe too little, too late for the whole oh. <laughs> I'm real concerned about the sense of humor of some of you folks. <laughs> Gee, that was a bad day. I didn't much want to be a lawman anymore after that. So I gave it up and I moved on. Oh, I bounced across Kansas again, doing the things I like to do to try and make myself feel a little better. I mean, sure, I had a drink or 
several. <laughs> but I didn't find good card games about any town I went to. Now, at this point in my life, after I'd shot my deputy in Abilene, my friends were worried about me. They said I was drinking way too much, spinning out of control, wasting my life away, and well, they all wanted to give me a leg up of sorts. And when I ran into Buffalo Bill Cody, now I know y'all know who that is, and Buffalo Bill and our other friend Texas Jack, well, they come up and say, Bill, we're taking a Wild West show out to the East Coast, and we would be honored if you would join us. I'm not doing much else at the time and really needing some money. I said, why not? Let's take that Wild West show out there and show them Easterners just how wild it really is out here. Truth be told, I didn't care for that. Now, some people are showmen and some are Buffalo Bill. Heck yeah, there's a showman for you. Me? No, not so much. And you know, I did get into a little bit of trouble out there. See, my friend Buffalo Bill, he didn't think it was right that I was drinking and carrying on during the shows and, well, he took my liquor away. And I'm here to tell you, it made me rather ornery. <laughs> I shot the lights out of Madison Square Garden Shot a couple of extras with blanks and started their pants on fire because I thought it was funny. Uh, yeah, they didn't. <laughs> I'd say by the end of it all, my good friend Buffalo Bill regretted every minute of taking me with on that tour. So I saved the trouble of firing me and I quit. Oh, the West was calling me again. Anyhow, I had to get back out here. I ended up over there in Cheyenne, Wyoming Territory. Now, when I got to Cheyenne, well, I found me a card game right away, because that's just what I do. I played for a couple days, was doing pretty good. I look up from the table, and in walks a lady friend, Agnes Lake. Now, see, I've known Agnes for years, and well, we got back together, it's like we never left each other. I found out she's as fond of me as I was of her, so I asked her to marry me. You know what she said? Yeah. Well, of course she said yes. I wouldn't even tell the story if she said no. <laughs> yeah, she did say yes. We had a nice little wedding, and then I, I whisked her away on a honeymoon to Cincinnati. I know, I said the same thing, woo! <laughs> well, we did honeymoon in Cincinnati for a short spell, but Agnes, she had worked there, she's running a circus by this time, and well, I had to get back out here, so I left her there and I headed back west. Oh, I figured to myself, Cheyenne, seemed like a right fine town. Maybe that's where I'll go start start working on a fortune so me and Agnes can retire. Turns out, Cheyenne was not nearly as good to me as I'd initially hoped. Now, I went on this, this long streak of bad luck, you see, and I lost all my money at the card tables. I ended up penniless in the streets of Cheyenne. You know what they did to me? They arrested me! They told me I was a vagrant! They told me to either leave Cheyenne right now, or you'll spend the rest of your time here in the jailhouse. Now, not wanting to spend a whole bunch of time in the Cheyenne jail, I did heed them warnings and I left. But as I got to the outskirts of Cheyenne, I ran into this big wagon train biggest one I'd ever seen. I look up front and who's running that thing? None other than my best friend in all the world, Colorado Charlie Utter. You guys know Colorado Charlie? No? Nobody knows Colorado Charlie? Come on, he's famous. Maybe you should 
pick up a book every once in a while. <laughs> Charlie and I, we've been best friends ever since I was a marshal in Hayes City. And when he saw me on the edge of town like that, he got this big grin on his face. He says, Bill, get on this wagon train with us. Huge gold strike in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory. I tell you what, you come with us, I got a gold claim up there. You can work the claim. I'll drive freight back and forth, and we'll split the money 50-50. Well, being how it was for me there in Cheyenne, that was not a hard decision to make. I hopped that wagon train with him. There's all sorts of fine folks on there, over 200 of them. 70 plus wagons, all filled with goods for this town right here. Now we headed north out of Cheyenne, spent about a week out on the prairie before we pulled up at Fort Laramie. Now, when we got to the fort, they were excited to see us because, well, some ladies had stopped by there and they were causing all sorts of trouble at that fort. The guys weren't getting their work done, they weren't getting any sleep at night. The colonel wanted him gone. He come around out the wagon train and says, Fellas, get these women out of here. They're nothing but trouble. I can't get a thing out of the guys. We look over. Here's 30M and Madam Mustache. No, a little tidbit was there. And, well, this other scrungy looking fella actually turned out not to be a fella at all. <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Calamity Jane. Now, I also know you've been starting and spreading some rumors about myself and Calamity maybe somehow being romantically involved. Not true. Come on, if you'd have seen her on that day, you'd know why. She looked like a man. She dressed like a man. She drank like a man. She cursed like a man. She, she smelled like a man. Yeah, no thanks. Besides, didn't I just tell y'all I was married? Yeah, them rumors get back to Agnes. I'm in all sorts of trouble. Now, I probably shouldn't talk bad about Calamity, though, because for all the problems that she has, I don't know anybody that ain't got their problems. She has got a heart of gold. If you've got a problem and Calamity Jane is anywhere around, She'll help you out, I guarantee you, just the kind of person she is. Now, we did get to be friends, and they all got on that wagon train with us. Another week and a half later, we pull up on the edge of town out here. We look down over this gulch, and it stinks something fierce. It was dirty and muddy and nasty. One street, Main Street, the horses, the cattle, the oxen, they go right down that street and do their business. People dumped their garbage in the street. They dumped their chamber pots in the street. It was gross. The people didn't care. No, they didn't come here for how it smelled or how it looked. You know why they came here, right? Gold. That's right. We had gold. And that gold fever will just grab a hold of you and it won't let go. Now, I was no different than anybody else that came here. I wanted my fortune in gold, too. Knew I had a working gold claim out there. Went right out and started working it. And I worked it hard for about three hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I found out real fast that gold mining was not for me. But Deadwood being what it is, all the people, the gold, the saloons, the gambling halls, well, it didn't take me long to find something else to do in this town. I was downtown playing cards. Now, seeing that table and them cards said I don't like that is giving me quite an itching to play right now. If I get three of you volunteer to play some cards with me, that'd be great. Don't everybody jump at once. It's kind of overwhelming. <laughs> There's one right there. There's one right there. I need one more card player and a bartender. There he is. Come on up. I need a bartender. Come on, simply. You just got to stand me on the bar. 
You'll do it? No? You want to do it? All right, come on up. Come on up here, guys. All right, Charlie, you're over there. Captain, you're right there. Carl, you're right there. Harry, you're behind the bar. Get to work and place the mat. I tell you what, I'm not a talk with these fellas. Let them know what it's like to play cards here in Deadwood. I'm pretty sure they know. They look pretty seasoned to me. Listen to this, fella. He's going to tell you all about what's going on in this town right now. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing? All right. I'm doing good. Okay, here's what's going to happen. Hi, folks, and welcome to the Old Style Saloon Number 10. In a few moments, you will step back in time to witness what happened on that fateful day, August 2nd, 1876, when wild Bill Hickok was gunned down by crooked-nosed Jack McCall. The employees of the number 10 will set the scene for you, so sit back, hang on to your sarsaparilla, and we'll start from the beginning. It was during the latter part of August, 1875, Frank Bryant and a party of seven gazed down into a gulch of tangled, broken trees, which from then on was to be known as Deadwood Gulch. They made their way to the bottom and began to pan for gold. Soon the cry of gold echoed up and down the canyon walls. They hastily built a crude cabin east of their find, but nevertheless went on to prospect throughout the northern hills, only to return on November 8, 1875, to post a claim of their discovery. On the very next day, November 9, 1875, a second group filed a claim just short of three miles up the creek. This outlined a stretch that was destined to become known as the richest placer claim area, not only in North America, but the entire Western Hemisphere. As news of this bonanza leaked out, the rush was on, resulting in a flood of mankind from all directions. The army could no longer stop the invasion of the fortune hunters. By August 2nd of 1876, Deadwood Gulch, now known as Deadwood City, and often referred to as Sin City, had acquired a worldwide reputation as a booming metropolis. Its surrounding hills and creeks were loaded with gold. Even greenhorns were said to be able to find nuggets, uh, well, as they put it, bigger than horse turds. Its streets were lined with substantial businesses, offering everything from an opera house to dance halls. Saloons and banks, stores of every sort, but mainly <laughs> saloons and gambling dens. Deadwood Gulch was jam-packed with every variety of mankind, good and bad. The likes of Wild Bill Hickok, Seth Bullock, Wyatt Earp, Calamity Jane, Colorado Charlie Utter, California Joe, and Preacher Smith. Somewhere between four to 6,000 of them. They came with greed or lust and high ideals, but the frenzied excitement that Deadwood provided well satisfied their pioneer spirits. Two guys named Nuttall and Mann couldn't picture themselves seeking their fortune as prospectors and instead built a house on their placer claim, Number 10, which became known as Saloon Number 10. On the morning of August 2nd, 1876, Harry Young was tending bar in the Number 10. His hair was greased, as was customary for bartenders in gold camps. This was essential as part of a method used by bartenders to collect a little extra loot for themselves. Before reaching into a prospector's poke for a pinch of gold to collect for a given whiskey, the bartender would rub his fingers through his greasy hair, thus oiling them well. He would deposit the unoiled gold dust into the boss's take, and by again rubbing his fingers through his hair, redeposit the oily flakes where it could be washed out later. It's said that there was a bald-headed barkeep who was known to have half a dozen hair pieces, all well-oiled. His take was enormous, as the laundering process was more efficient. The dance hall girls had arrived on Colorado Charlie Utter's wagon train in late June, ready and willing to entertain the thousands of eligible prospectors. Some came with hopes of finding the right man. Others came simply to make their own fortune. Their attire, somewhat more revealing than what was thought to be proper, was looked down upon by those trained in ladylike etiquette. But nonetheless, they brought to the gold rush an air of reckless, dazzling excitement. By August 2nd, 1876, they were well established up and down Deadwood City's main street, working around the clock in one fashion or the other. Honky Tonk Piano and their songs of promising spirit filled the air. Many an unlucky prospector could find hope for tomorrow, for he knew what the night would bring.
three o'clock in the afternoon, Wild Bill Hickok entered saloon number 10, seeking a little poker action. Charlie Rich, a gambler from That's Cheyenne, it, fellas. Carl That's Mann, it. owner of saloon number 10, yeah, card you play and Captain you Massey, three of them. a riverboat captain from Missouri, oh, like were engaged draw in the game here. of draw poker guys. and were quick to invite Bill second. to join them. Yeah, shot of that whiskey, Harry. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Wild Bill's reputation hey, demanded that he be exceedingly cautious. Hey, for for instance, he never liked to sit with his back to the door. All? The vacant seat was so located, on, and a lively here, debate second. between Charlie Rich and Bill Take resulted care. in an attempt on Bill's part to get Charlie's chair. Charlie, get out of my chair. I don't think so, Bill. I don't think What do you mean you don't think so? I <laughs> sit there, you know it, get out. This Bill was not given chair. his request, Girl, and lucky you think it with is? great hesitation, took the empty night. chair. But after a few minutes, he stood up and again asked Charlie for his chair. Dang it, Charlie, I can't sit here and you know it. Now get out of that stinking Bill chair. Bill didn't win this argument either. And on this rare occasion, he settled down, sitting with his back to the door. Fine. Wariness, though, take your kept money Bill alert. For all Charlie. knew him to be a left-handed drinker, guy, leaving Carl? his right hand free to handle yeah. his pistol. As unpredictable as card right, games are, Bill? Bill found himself quickly losing to Massey, who had lost to Bill the night before. Harry? Bill asked Harry for $15 Thank worth of pocket so chips. Harry brought them over to Bill and right, returned to the back. bar and his Charlie. duties. See how lucky that chair really is, huh? Soon a shifty drifter known sound? as Jack McCall yeah. entered the saloon. Bill quickly there, turned Carl. while drawing his gun. Recognizing McCall as a newcomer to town, he greeted him with a friendly, Howdy, Jack. Then reholstered his gun and resumed the game. Night playing. I can't Jack came back slowly today circled the, the table, meeting, pausing talked. briefly behind each player and analyzing each hand. All right, we all in for six? Come on now, how's about a drink for me? You in there for six? Oh, come on now, one for you and one for me. Come on, one for you. Ah, yeah, I'm going to take every cent you've got. Wild Bill's attention was on Massey. There was a friendly argument between them, and Wild Bill remarked, Good ones, Massey. I don't want any of that garbage. You Upon returning directly behind Wild Bill, suddenly yeah. Jack McCall... Take that, Jamie! Ah! I can't stop so I struck Bill in the back of the head, coming out of his left cheek and lodged in Captain Massey's left arm. It was discovered soon after the cards Bill was holding were aces and eights, forever known as the dead man's hand. All fled the saloon except Carl Mann, who was held at bay by McCall. Jack snapped the trigger of his gun several times. It failed to fire. He then ran out the door and up the street. He was found hiding in a building behind a butcher shop. Later on in the day, he was tried in a miner's court. The jury, being tainted and influenced by a deceitful defense, found McCall not guilty, and he was released. This decision not only outraged the judge, but also the general populace. McCall left the camp in haste, Upon reaching supposed safety in Wyoming, he began bragging of his ignoble deed. Word of this reached a U.S. Marshal who tracked McCall down, arrested him, and sent him to Yankton to be tried again in Dakota Territory. It was determined, since the first trial was held in Indian Territory, that it was not legal. McCall was found guilty and hung for his cowardly crime. He was buried in an unmarked grave on the edge of town. Later, as the town grew, the cemetery was moved. As the coffins were opened, one corpse was found with a rope around its neck. It was easily identified as Jack McCall, the assassin of Wild Bill. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for taking your time to allow us. Hey, let's hear for these volunteers. They did a great job. Thank you, guys. You're all fantastic. I do appreciate your help. Enjoy your bandanas on the table there. Hey, we'll be up here for a little while. If you guys want a picture with me or Jack over 